Of the many bills Americans struggle to pay, student loan debt is one of the biggest burdens carried by particularly young people in this country. There is more than 1.6 trillion, with a T, dollars in outstanding student loan debt. And the number is rising largely because most people are unable to pay off their loans faster than the interest rate or the interest accumulates. Only 51% of federal borrowers who were scheduled to start paying back their loans in 2010 to 2012 had made any progress at all after five years. This massive student debt burden is preventing people from being able to start a small business, or buy a home, forcing some students to drop out of college altogether before completing their degree. In the past, economic downturns have devastated the ability to young, of young people to pay back their student loans, and the current crisis is no exception. In March, Congress passed the CARES Act, which had some very basic relief for student borrowers. Under the CARES Act, student loan borrowers do not have to make payments and interest will not accrue on their loans through September 30th, 2020. And these deadlines were extended through December by executive order. However, these protections only extended to federally granted student loans and not to private student loans, which constitute billions of dollars in their own right. To address the loopholes on this relief coverage, a bar bipartisan group of members of Congress have proposed the Student Loan Fairness Act of 2020, which would extend the protection of the CARES Act to private student loans instead of just federal student loans. Last month, the attorney generals of more than 30 states signed a letter to Congress urging them to pass this relief. Now, some Democratic senators want to go even further for people struggling under the burden of student loan debt. Last week, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Chuck Schumer proposed a resolution that would effectively cancel student loan payments during the crisis. And it calls on Donald Trump to cancel up to $50,000 in student loan debt per person impacted by the executive order. This request comes though, even as the Trump administration has faced criticism and a class action lawsuit for failing to halt wage garnishment for student loan debt during the crisis. Even before COVID-19, student debt was a major issue for the majority of voters. And according to multiple polls from last year, people really care about this issue. New polling from Data for Progress shows that a majority of both parties, bipartisan support, um, support a plan like Warren's or Schumer's to forgive student loan debt. Biden, if elected, has promised some form of student debt relief for certain borrowers, certain borrowers entering public service, but has not proposed across the board debt forgiveness. In light of the limited action by the federal government to ease student debt, some state governments are stepping up to the challenge. This summer, the Colorado legislature passed the Get On Your Feet Act, which will help students who remain in Colorado after school access state provided funding to pay down their student debt. To discuss how governments can relieve pressure on student, student loan debtors, relieve the pressure that the debt places on individual borrowers and young people and the economy as a whole. We are joined by two of the Colorado lawmakers who helped pass the Get On Your Feet Act and by Seth Frotman, a leading expert on student loan debt and executive director of the Student Borrower Protection Center. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Um, Representative Herod, I wanna start with you. Through the legislature, You've been pushing for student debt relief consistently during this crisis. Can you tell us about some of the experiences that you've heard about that your, your constituents are telling you that are motivating you to push so hard for this relief? Yeah, absolutely. And first I wanna thank you for having me and for bringing light to this very important issue. So welcome to Denver in our house, virtually Zooming um, to you all. Um, I gotta say that student loan debt is an issue across the country, but of course we're experiencing here it here right here in Colorado. Um, the student student debt has reached a crisis point, and the cost of college is increasing year after year. And of course, the situation that we're in right now with COVID has just made it worse. More than seven hundred and sixty thousand Coloradans are working right now to pay back over twenty seven billion dollars in student loan debt. And people of color, especially black students and families are more likely to have student loan debt and more likely to pay higher amounts of debt than our white counterparts. So when we talk about how people are experiencing this issue right now, 
I think of my district. I think of young people who are young people of color who struggled just to make it into college only to be riddled by thousands of dollars worth of debt. And then to graduate in a recession and come out with this debt that they just can't afford to pay. Unfortunately, too many young people that I talk to are making the decision to not pay their debt or default. And we know that that has devastating consequences on their ability to garner that generational wealth that we all wanna see happen in the future. And so this is a real issue that we're facing. And it's something that we have to address head on and at the state level. Thank you so much for that. Um, speaking of addressing it head on, can you tell us what the Get On Your Feet Act does for young people in Colorado who are struggling with student debt? And how, did, how, does, the, how does the act basically change things for the families you describe, particularly black and brown families maybe particularly impacted by this issue? Yeah. Well, as we talked about, students of color are disproportionately impacted, right? And we talked a little bit about that generational wealth, but I want to bring that home a little bit. So what Get On Your Feet Act does is it allows you to, it allows you to have two years of student loan forgiveness repayment by the state government, as long as you're enrolled in an income-based rep repayment program. So what that does is it literally allows students to get back on their feet. It allows them to find housing, healthcare, and a real career opportunity when they graduate from school. This is something that's typically reserved for students who were born into generational wealth, those who can rely on their parents for income or housing and really can focus on their career and not working multiple jobs, right, just to get on their feet. This will give students that break. But unfortunately, again, due to COVID, we weren't able to fund this act in the way that we want to moving forward. So we have a lot of work to do, which is why I'm so excited to hear from my colleague and good friend, Senator Steve Finberg, about how we plan to address this moving forward because, you know, Stephen really is an architect behind this work here in Colorado. He has done the work with the students. I'm proud to be a partner in that, but he's leading the way. So I, I gotta say, I, I wanna hear from Steve about how we're gonna move this forward. Steve, I'm happy to have you chime in, Senator Steve Fenberg. Um, yeah, tell us about um, what you see the act doing, and I'm, I'm happy to, to fold in any of the stories of the students that you've met with. But also, you know, given the limited budget of state governments, even one as, as robust as Colorado, um, I'd love for you to talk about this through the lens also of like what could be done if you had the money of the federal government. Yeah, well, first of all, um, thank you for, for having us and talking about this incredibly important issue. It, it really is a crisis. And, and I think it's, it almost feels trendy to call something a crisis right now. But this is, this is one that has been brewing well before the uh, current health and financial crisis of COVID um, and is only going to get worse. Um, what I would say is um, the, the, the real reason why this is important is because as uh, Representative Harrod said, it, it allows young people, an entire generation who are coming out of higher education. And again, I mean, our country directs people to get a college degree. And, and I think higher education is, is valuable and it's worth it. And um, these young people go into college, they go into more debt than they can even comprehend, right? Uh, this is probably the biggest financial decision they'll ever make uh, in their young lives, and they're told just do it, deal with it later, and it'll all work out. And we're seeing now that that is catching up to us. And so this is important, not just for those individuals, because it does have potentially devastating impacts on, on young people and families to have this much debt, um, right, when they're entering the workforce. But it's also incredibly important for our economy. We can't have a generation of people who just have to make these monthly payments and therefore can't start a business or can't buy a house or buy a car or start a family. Um, that is going to have uh, detrimental impacts on our economy as well. And that was true before this crisis. That's especially true when it comes to the recovery of this crisis. And so, you know, I, I think this has been especially important. Leslie and I went to college together. I represent the, the community uh, where that university is located here in Boulder, Colorado. And so it's close to home for us. Uh, we we're fighting for this issue when we were in college. We're still fighting for it now that we're uh, old fogies that are uh, many years out of college. Uh, but um, this is important, especially in Colorado. And uh, that's because our we have such 
uh, um, difficult financial constraints on our state budget. We have something called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which sounds great, but it is devastating to our economy um, and to our state budget and our ability to fund basic services like education. And so we have gone over the course of about 20 years, um, you know, from, from funding uh, uh, higher education majority based on tax dollars to now uh, our universities get about two or 3% of their budget from the state. The rest is either private money uh, or it's tuition based. And so how did, how did we fill that hole? We kept raising tuition because it was the only way to keep the lights on at these universities. And uh, it's not that young people have gotten wealthier and all of a sudden they can foot the bill. It's that they were able to take out debt and just deal with it later. Um, and now is later and we are seeing it catch up to us. And so we need to further prioritize funding at a state level. We have big constraints here in Colorado that other states don't have. Um, but you're right, a huge part of the solution has to come from the federal government. It's policy changes like um, potentially forgiving debt uh, for allowing more flexibility and refinancing and consolidation that we can do on all kinds of other debt, um, but not on student loans. Uh, per, uh, we need to make sure some of these protections from the Obama administration are put back in place when it comes to uh, taking care of the bad actors that are in the, the industry. Um, but it also is simply about money. That's a big part of it. This is a financial problem. The federal government needs to, has always needed to, to up their game. Um, they especially need to now with the COVID-19 uh, um, uh, crisis on us. And that's, again, important for these individuals to get some relief so they can start their lives uh, in a meaningful way. It's important for our economy so that those individuals can give back to our economy by being consumers and participating fully. It's also important for the future of higher ed right now. Higher ed is, is uh, barely staying alive through this crisis. Uh, kids are now questioning uh, in, in a serious way why they would pay that tuition to just take all their classes on Zoom and not have the normal college experience. And so colleges and universities are under an enormous amount of pressure right now. Um, and so we need to do this for many reasons, not just for the individuals saddled with the debt, but for our institutional structures as well. So what I'm hearing from you is sort of, it's like, like the water cycle, but with money and nightmares, right? So like you're, you're talking about cuts to higher ed that resulted in higher tuition, that result in ballooning need for loans, that result in young people taking on the burden of paying for something that the government perhaps should have been paying for all along um, and then struggling. And then when they can't pay, their ability to have a livelihood, to buy houses, to participate in the economy suffers and the economy suffers as a whole. That's a big picture and that's a lot of moving parts. And I know that both you and Representative Herod started out working together and have worked together for a long time, all the way back at uh, New Era Colorado. So I'd love for you to, to talk to us about the degree to which grassroots organizing and sort of working from the ground up on these really, really big problems has informed your approach to something as huge as this is. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So Leslie and I, um... When we were in college, we we were rabble rousers, and you know it was kind of a, a pain in the butt to the administration and and whatnot. And then when we graduated, uh, Leslie likes to say we we needed to find me a job, uh, so we created a job for me through New Era Colorado. But but in reality, it, we saw that young people are a political force to be reckoned with if they are mobilized, and the issues that are important to them are the issues that are so important to to our entire uh, society today, whether it's climate, student debt. Um, uh, so many different issues are really, th these are the issues that young people are inheriting. So they need to have a seat at the table um, to, to help solve these problems. Um, and so we started New Era Colorado, which, which organizes and engages young people in the political process. They have been a driving force in moving Colorado forward in, into the state that it is today. Um, this state has had a political transformation over the last decade or so. Um, and I, would, I think it's in large part because of young people uh, organizing, mobilizing, making their voice heard and voting in very large numbers. So the issues they care about can't be ignored. Um, so uh, I think it, it's important. The lesson learned, I think, is that um, people uh, with shared interests need to be organized uh, to make sure those voices are heard. And those voices, if, if they are organized, if they are loud enough, and if they're done strategically, those issues will get paid attention to more uh, through the election, through ballot measures, through politicians who want their vote, 
Um, and then through policymaking uh, in, in legislatures all over the country, like Leslie and I are um, experiencing right now. So it, it's incredibly important. Um, it is, uh, this is, I, I think, an existential crisis for this generation. And so they have to be part of the solution. That means uh, they have to be at the table talking about the issues and the, and, the, and the solutions, but it also means they need to be elected. They need to help elect people because um, back in the day when Leslie and I were in college, I think we looked at the legislature and not a lot of those people probably had much student debt. It wasn't a big issue. So they probably thought, well, let's increase tuition a little bit every year and it'll, it should be okay because I paid off my debt. You know, I, 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 I made it work. It's a different story today. And those, uh, that's why it's important that people like Leslie and myself are in the legislature fighting for these issues because we experienced it. We still experience it. The reason why I have a virtual background on is because I'm actually in my tool shed <laughs> because I don't have a home office and I am saddled with debt and, and our entire generation is experiencing that right now. And um, we need to be part of uh, bold solutions to move it forward. So young people um, absolutely have been the driving force for almost every major transformation this country has seen since the beginning of, of, of us becoming a nation, um, whether it's civil rights, the LGBT movement, um, and, and I think climate change issues. And I think when it comes to student debt and the student debt crisis that we are faced with, it's gonna come from young people as well to solve it. Yeah, I'd love to talk about the context for a minute that you're, that you're pointing out so eloquently. Um, <clears throat> Seth Frotman, turning to you, um, the United States is the only country that is doing this to their young people, to our young people, to us. Um, and it has grown, the, the student debt has grown enormously, exponentially in the last few decades. So can you tell us like, how did we get here and why are so many Americans struggling to live their lives carrying debt that they will never be able to pay off? Well, first, thanks so much for having me on, Emily. And it's an honor to be here with two of the fiercest fighters on behalf of student loan debt in the country. Um, and a lot of um, what they talked about happening in Colorado is you know, the challenges that everyday Americans face literally from coast to coast. If you're in the Bible Belt, if you're in New York City, nearly the only constant across those communities is just the tremendous struggle that people have with student debt. And just to put some more numbers on this, you said it's $1.7 trillion, which means nearly 45 million Americans get a student loan bill each and every month. And just to show you kind of how bad the struggle was even before COVID, there were 9 million borrowers who had defaulted on their loan. Just in 2019, um, around 1.25 million borrowers defaulted. So every 26 seconds of every single day, another borrower defaulted on their loans. To give you just some set of context, that's four times the number of borrowers who had their house taken in a foreclosure. Another 3 million borrowers were severely behind on their student loans. And right, those are only the people who have fallen behind. There are millions other, million, millions of others who pay their bill every month, but now we have data that shows it's impacting their ability to save for retirement. It's uh, uh, struggling for uh, retirement security. We see how student debt is even driving um, family formations, marriage decisions. You know, totally crazy to think about just a short period of time ago. But I think where this gets really scary is the ripple effect. Um, as a rep representative was talking about, the same communities that are being just devastated by the COVID crisis were the ones who are bearing the brunt of the student debt crisis. Um, and you see how time and time again, when these markets fail, the most vulnerable borrowers are the ones who really bear the brunt. And we see how student debt is driving income inequality, racial inequality, and leaving behind enormous segments of the American population. I think what, what I always like to say is student debt is like the kerosene on the fire of all of the, the problems that we know are just facing our communities and our country. And I think Senator Fenberg summed this up really well. We have just seen a tremendous uh, disinvestment in higher education in this country. And I think there was this thought that somehow student debt is good debt. 
and we could just fill in the gap and everyone would be kind of better off. And I think this trillion dollar experiment we've had in debt fueled higher education is just a miserable failure. And I think the first thing we re really need to do is recognize that so we could drive change. The first step to solving the problem is admitting that you have a problem or so I am told. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of admitting problems, I would like to ask you to admit other people's problems. Um, the executive branch holds significant power over the management of federal loans. How would you evaluate the Trump administration's approach towards student loan debt in the last four years? So it's just been an abysmal failure. I think just to put uh, a finer point. So essentially the Department of Education is now one of the world's largest banks. The federal government and the bank at the center of the Department of Education holds around 1.3 to 1.5 trillion dollars, which is currently held by Betsy DeVos. And every single day since she has come into office, she has chosen to make life harder for student loan borrowers. Um, at every instance, she has sided with predatory student loan companies, student loan servicers, for-profit schools, over ripped off borrowers. Um, the budget proposals she has put forth have, uh, if, if, we're, if they were enacted, would have added hundreds of billions of dollars more of student debt. And as you mentioned to start, even when Congress stepped in to try to help borrowers struggling under uh, the COVID fallout, um, just mismanagement and incompetence allowing uh, employers to illegally seize borrowers' wages, illegally seizing borrowers' tax refunds. Just time and time again, you see how borrowers, um, in addition to the weight of the student loan debt, um, have these enormous headwinds because of the incompetence of the Department of Education. That's a very grim picture. Um, so I'd love to sort of open the floor to all three of you here. And I do have a question for all three of you while we are on the topic of grim pictures. I think somebody said that crisis was trendy right now. So let's just lean into it. Let's go there. Um, because student loan debt is such a massive fact of life, for young people um, and not so young people, <laughs> people who are living with debt well into their 50s and 60s. Um, these debts obviously have repercussions for the economy writ large. So I'd love each of you to unpack for us a few long-term consequences that you can foresee if Congress doesn't take comprehensive action towards debt forgiveness during the crisis. Um, let's start with um, Leslie, then let's go to Steve and Seth. Yeah. Well, um, so as Steve pointed out, you know, we're all um, dealing with the student loan debt. And I want to put a finer point. I know we talked about my constituents, but I also have to talk about myself too. I mean, I went to a state school, University of Colorado at Boulder, great school, go Buffs. Um, and I'm still dealing with student loan debt right now. And people like me are having to decide whether or not they're going to take the next step in their career and take those big risks knowing that they might not be able to pay that debt back. As a state legislator and folks who are running for office, and I know so many more young people are thinking about running, thank you. Um, you can't afford to when you're dealing with all this debt and that's just real. So we're having real long-term consequences, but we're not talking just about young people. I'm no longer young as Steve pointed out and I'm still dealing with it, right? Um, and Steve is still dealing with it. This is a huge problem that we need to address. But on a finer point, the impact that it has on the state level, especially right now, as we're all dealing with this recession and the co and COVID and the economy, is that we're not actually getting that revenue from people who are earning more, right? We're not actually able to see that revenue in people spending money in our local economies. That means we're able to uh, invest less in programs that will get people back on their feet in general from COVID. That's a huge problem. So we are having long-term impacts on our economy right here in Colorado because of the student loan debt. And then I see people in the comments too talking about, you know, having to only take one class a year because that's all they can afford and not being able to really jump into that next step in their career because of that. That's a huge, huge, huge problem and we have to address it. So this is not, you know, limited to, to, to some, you know, what do they say, like entitled young person who expects everything for free. That's not what we're talking about here. 
We are talking about what linchpins in our economy, which is higher education, access to good jobs, and being prepared for those good jobs, being available to all of us. And, and that's hugely important. And so as the chair of the finance committee here in Colorado, understanding those devastating impacts on our revenue and our state general fund, we're gonna have to deal with that this year, next year, and for years to come. But fixing this issue and addressing this issue at the federal and state level means that we're gonna be able to have more flexibility to give back, to bring down the cost of higher education for all of Coloradans, but also to provide those essential services that we all need to recover strong. Well, um, I, I think I think we've all talked about all the many of the different um, domino effect impacts this can have, and I, and I I really don't think that's something that can be underestimated. Um, this is a student debt crisis. We know the last financial crisis um, was, uh, in some ways, we, we refer to it as a housing and a finance crisis. This will lead to another one of those crises, right? Um, people will not be able to make their payments on their home because they're saddled with debt. Um, maybe, maybe when they um, come off of an income-based repayment program and then all of a sudden they have to make much larger payments or they'll never be able to qualify to buy a house in the first place. And, and so maybe let's say it doesn't mean that all of the cards start to fall and that it's a total economic disaster right away. But what it will mean is further gentrification of our communities. What it will mean is people with money will be able to make money and people who, are, who have debt to pay will get further and further behind and it, the income disparity will just grow literally exponentially over the course of a couple of years. Because we know if, if someone is entering the economy and maybe they have a decent job, but they, they can't qualify to buy a house because they have a debt to income ratio of slightly too too off to qualify for those extra payments. Many of us have gone through those, those calculations and those little widgets on the internet to see what you can qualify for. Um, entire generations are not gonna be able to qualify. And that is gonna dramatically shape what our communities look like because certain people will be able to own property and others won't. And that starts to feel a whole lot like uh, what America used to look like not what we think of as the American dream, what we tell young people, go to college, get a good job, buy a starter house, start a family. That's no longer gonna be a reality for literally millions and millions of people. And that has a, a, an impact that's yes, economic, but it also is, in, is devastating to the cultural uh, um, aspects of our communities when it just is about who is able to, to own property. And we know that is a, a door that opens um, to, to further wealth that you can then pass on to generations. And we are just going to see the, the, the disparity grow over and over and over again. Um, uh, really, honestly, something like that can take two, three years to have an impact um, to dig a hole that is, is maybe impossible to dig out of without a couple of generations um, trying to fix it. So it, this is, it, it, you really can't, uh, overestimate the the impact this could have on communities across the country. So I, I, I'm going to, Seth, forgive me, I'm going to now ask you a different question because of what Steve just said. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's very concrete. That is a lot of damage. That's generational damage that you're talking about. Um, that's damage that spans multiple industries and measures of the economy. Um, and it it's, it, it's not, uh, it, it, I, I, I don't, it does not seem to me that you are, are, are speculating here. So I'd love to ask you, Seth, to speak specifically to what opposition there could be to this perspective. What is the opposition to debt forgiveness? Where is it coming from? Um, why is it powerful? Um, and, and how, knowing what Steve has just said, um, are folks on your side responding to it? So I think what this comes down to, and I think uh, Senator Fenberg mentioned this before, is um, just the entirely different experience that even people who went to college a generation ago had, right? I think we have added a trillion dollars of student loan debt essentially overnight. Um, and there are a lot of people who still walk the halls of Congress, 
who still sit in seats in state legislatures, um, who, who I just don't think realize how bad it, it has gotten about the cumulative impact um, that their decisions have, um, have left on an entire generation of people in terms of the student debt that they carry. And I think just to put a little bit of context, I think we obviously often talk about this as um, you know, a young person issue. Um, and I think you, know, you, you hear from a lot of this crowd about how this is just a generation who's eaten too much avocado toast or you know, whatever um, really ridiculous um, statement, but like nothing could be further from the truth. So the fastest growing segment of student loan borrowers are actually older Americans who've seen their ranks quadruple, their balances double. Um, and I think what it comes down to um, is organizing. I think what you've seen in Colorado, um, both at the grassroots level um, through obviously having representatives like these are people who just get it, right? Are people who are able to kind of look the old school legislators in the eye in, and say, you know, we are not gonna be lectured by a bunch of people who paid for college with, you know, the pocket change they had from summer jobs, right? Because that is not our experience. Um, and um, what you are saying just isn't borne out by reality. And I think just to, to just quickly read back to the last question, I think what's really scary about this is um, you see how the lingering effects of consumer debt after a recession hold entire communities back. So there's this amazing data which shows that the people who had the most debt after the last great recession took years longer to ever recover um, and, and saw you know, their much more affluent counterparts just take off while they struggled. Um, and I think what you're gonna see here is unless we deal with the student debt crisis, um, we're gonna repeat history. And what we know um, is because of um, the racial wealth gap in this country, we are gonna see communities of color and borrowers cover left behind even more after the COVID crisis, unless we deal with this problem. So having now painted an extremely bleak picture of massively increased racially inflected wealth gaps and inequity uh, and being at the end of our show, I would like to ask each of you, we'll go in the reverse order this time, um, each of you to talk about something beyond forgiveness, beyond debt forgiveness, that could be enacted that is feasible at the, either the state or federal level that could make higher education more accessible to people. That could be lessening the cost of higher education, some strategy beyond debt forgiveness that is a sustainable strategy that state and local and federal legislators should be considering now. Seth, we'll start with you and then and back in the reverse order. Sure, so one of the things we covered a lot today is just like the sheer amount of student debt that people have had to take on. Um, but the other side of the coin is that there's a whole host of financial companies who view the student debt crisis as their chance to get rich. Um, so these are student loan companies who see that $1.7 trillion and try to figure out how to build a business model that rips people off. So these are student loan servicers, student loan debt, corrector, debt collectors, predatory for-profit schools, you name it. Um, and I think uh, this matters because what we see is how these companies could add billions of dollars of needless debt on top of what borrowers already have. And I think this is where we've seen tremendous progress in state legislatures. Um, Colorado um, passed what they call SB2, which empowered their state um, to crack down on folks like these. Um, and we've seen similar actions across the country. Um, and I know obviously um, it's not as uh, you know, high stakes and big systemic reform as student debt forgiveness, but you know, I've traveled the country and people just can't understand why on top of the debt they've already had, they're kind of forced to deal with these financial predators from the day they take out their loan until the day they pay it off. And this is a gap where we have seen states step up um, and we could see states do a whole lot more. Um, well, th there are so many things we, we could do and should do, both at the state and the federal level. Um, uh, I, I, th I think Seth talking about the protections and sort of the, the predatory nature of some of this industry is, is we have to get a handle on that. And a lot of that is going to take federal action. Um, we've done it here in Colorado to some degree, but we need the federal government to, to step in 
uh, in ways that they aren't right now. Um, but one very tangible thing is uh, that I think we can do, and this almost seems like a no brainer and a stupid to even say, but we need to close some corporate tax loopholes and put those savings into higher education, period. Um, we are uh, starving higher ed and forcing them to adopt a model that chases money rather than chases a mission of educating uh, the next generation of our workforce. And so uh, a lot of corporations and uh, private interests have benefited from, um, from having top-notch higher education in this country. Uh, we should make sure that they are not getting sweetheart deals while the rest of us are drowning in money and put those savings towards building back up these institutions that gave them so much over generations. Once again, I gotta agree with my, my colleague and good friend, Senator Steve Finberg. Um, we really do need to close some of these corporate loopholes. We are Colorado's 47th in the nation for higher education funding. We are not a poor state to be clear, um, but we are starving our students and having them drown in debt because we refuse to look at these loopholes. Um, as finance chair, something that I will be addressing um, in this upcoming session and something that we all need to talk about. Um, and so for me, what it does look like is funding higher education. Our top institutions here in Colorado and across the country, public institutions are no longer state schools. They're not nonprofits. They are making a ton of money and chasing that money because the state is not funding them, to be clear. Right. So when I went to college, I thought, oh, a state school, like I'm not going to have all this debt. Like it's it's not one of these Ivies that I couldn't even think about. No, that's not that's not state schools. You are leaving with debt and that needs to change. But a university can't afford to do that because the state is also not funding universities in a way that we should either. So that's something that we need to look at. But also when a young person graduates or I should say a person graduates from college, they should be going into old school apprenticeship programs. Look, other generations, our uh, generation of us didn't get it all wrong. You know, we need more apprenticeship programs that the state invests in so people can leave ready to work and with a job. Again, that benefits us all. So there's so much that we can do. Um, it, it starts with funding higher education in the appropriate way. We can get it into K-12, which is also not funded the way it should be. Um, but we've got to address the debt that our students, our young people, our adults are, are drowning in right now. And we need to fund higher education adequately, just like so many other countries right now. Thank you for that. That's a great final thought. Um, and thank you so much to our guests for joining us to talk about this vital topic, um, this looming crisis. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Emily Galvin Almanza. This has been The Briefing, a co-production of Now This and The Appeal. I hope you will join us tomorrow for more content you can't miss. Take care.